Good morning, Acton Faith Bible Church. Welcome once again to our online worship. Today we're going to be singing the song, All Glory Be to Christ. What a great reminder that whatever we're doing, whether we're at home, whether we're out and about, Christ is the one who receives all the glory. Good morning. 
We're back again. It's actually a Saturday morning when we're filming this. And right across the way, the women's Bible study is going on. They're back together for the first time in a long, long time. All spaced out properly and uh, getting the Bible from teacher Jenny Russell. So we're kind of excited about that. So um, Drive-In Church is going to be going on through June. And then we're looking at a way to get... Uh, in our buildings and be kind of spread out in the buildings that we have here on the property. Getting back into school, as far as we can tell, is not an option for a while. So we have to do the best we can and as the heat of the summer comes on we're going to try to be indoors but a little more spread out. So we're thinking through how to do all that and working on that. So uh, just be praying. We want to encourage you to um, be safe, uh, practice, uh, we, you know, it was fun last week seeing everybody together and we all got out and um, weren't a whole lot of masks and there's a lot of hugging going on and uh, we got to be a little more careful than that, I think. So let's try to practice uh, reasonable social distancing. I know it's not quite as big a deal outdoors, but uh, we do want to make sure everybody's safe and, and respectful of those that uh, don't want to get out of their cars and uh, need to stay um, inside and uh, be really separate. Uh, some people have physical conditions that require that, so we want to respect that as well. So um, just be full of love and uh, thinking about each other and each other's well-being. And uh, we're in Philippians chapter 3 again today, and this is a great passage. It's a very important principle to grasp for your Christian growth and maturity. So I want you to pay close attention. We'll be um, uh, focus pretty much on that one section today, starting about verse 12. Okay, get your Bibles open. All right, we are back in Philippians chapter 3 today. We're going to be uh, starting about verse 12. I want to tell you a little bit about myself by way of illustration. Hey, when I was in the fifth grade, my parents purchased an eight millimeter movie camera, you know, to get home movies like Christmas and birthday and trips and stuff like that. But pretty soon I took over the camera. It became mine. At least I thought it was mine. I started making movies and that became my singular passion. It was the one thing I thought about, I planned for, I spent my newspaper route money on. Um, now I did other things. I did enough homework to not get in trouble and I played baseball every summer, six days a week over at Lommel Park, trying to hit a foul ball over the water tower fence. And my family dutifully went to church every Sunday because that's what good people did back then. And I didn't mind that. Uh, it was a little boring, but um, that giant stained glass window they had was really cool. And the organ music and, and that visual thing just kind of made goosebumps on my body. So that was all right. Um, nobody shared the gospel there at the church we went to, but I, I did learn Bible stories in Sunday school, so I knew something about the Bible. By the time I was in high school, though, I, I got a better camera editing equipment. And did you know that in little, that t little tiny 8 millimeter film, you could put a little s stripe on there and of sound, like magnetic tape? It has that kind of thing actually on it. So I had sound movies. That was like a really big thing to me. So I got all my friends, a lot of theater kids and other people that would just had nothing else to do to act in these films that I made, like a musical comedy version of Macbeth that we made when I was in high school. My mom sewed costumes and my dad made props. So they weren't really surprised when I told them I wanted to go to film school. Um, they knew it was the one thing, the one thing I really wanted to do. Nothing else compared to that in my mind, in my heart. That's all I wanted to do. My last film as a high school and senior, which never quite got finished, had religious themes coursing all through it, which showed that I did have some interest in transcendent realities or values. I decided to make a film on the Crusades. Try to imagine making a film on the Crusades on 8mm film in Indiana. I mean, it's kind of strange. But um, the screenplay I wrote was all about this disillusioned knight that is going to the Holy Land. And um, he discovers a Bible and he finds out that what he's doing wrong. So he goes back home with the Bible and tells everybody that the whole thing they're doing is wrong. It's not, against, it's not according to the Bible. And I really like that theme, but I wasn't even a Christian at the time. You know how people say, I'm spiritual, but not religious. 
Well, I wasn't really very religious, and I wasn't awfully spiritual either, but I thought the Bible was a good book, and uh, even though it was kind of mysterious to me. So I ended up in California, attending a small film and television school in Hollywood, right downtown center of Hollywood, and at the school was a group of Christian guys, uh, most of whom went to this big, gigantic church in the valley. I mean, it was a really big church. They were from all over the place, and uh, one very funny and very intelligent guy who was really trying to drag me there was uh, from Singapore, so that was kind of interesting. So I went. I mean, why not go? It sounded interesting, and this guy up front at the church, he was like teaching the Bible, and I could understand it. It was amazing. He was teaching through Matthew's gospel. And at night, he was teaching through Daniel. And I was so fell in love with this ability to understand the Bible that he was giving me that I started going on night and Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. Uh, I was just captivated. Like, the Bible makes sense. You can understand it. It's actually about something. It's got a story. So I went all the time. And it didn't take long. I confessed Jesus as my Lord and Savior, and I got baptized there. And the world changed. I mean, my world changed. This was something very new, and I thought at first I could serve Jesus uh, and film, and maybe I could have. Uh, that would have been a perfectly honorable thing to do, but that desire after all those years completely changed. I had a new one thing that was most important in my life. And I wanted other people to experience what happened to me, so my one thing became to teach the Bible to the glory and the honor of Jesus, and faithfully to do that, and accurately. So I had to go home and tell my parents, you know, that film thing you labored beside me, encouraged me in for all those years, I want to go to Bible college and seminary instead. That's what I told them. And that's the one thing I want to do. That's what I said. And they were a little skeptical. They thought, is this some kind of a, you know, mood thing or just something temporary? And they very wisely, they said, well, why don't you finish your associate's degree? And then if this is still what you want to do, we'll support you. And I'm thinking, well, that's very fair. So here I am. That's what happened. It was actually very easy for me to lay down one thing, the one thing that was once everything for me and pick up something else that was of far more value. God has a way of helping us do that. So today's text in Philippians is about one thing that the Apostle Paul does. You can test your spiritual temperature by listening to him and seeing if you're doing the same one thing that he does. So we're not talking about Jesus as his one thing. I mean, Jesus is his heart, he's his joy, he's his life, he's everything. He is the one thing Paul worships and lives for. But this morning we're talking about how he does that one thing by a very practical one thing that he does to follow Christ faithfully. So this is how he follows Christ. It's very practical, and it should help you walk your walk with Christ in whatever field you work in and however you decide to use your time. So, you know, when somebody like Paul, the Apostle Paul, tells you that this one thing he makes sure he does, uh, I think we should pay attention to that. So this is the secret to his Christian walk. So last time we looked at Philippians 3, 1 through 11, and there we saw how Paul easily gave up and discounted his religious past what he calls confidence in the flesh. He put that all aside easily to have Christ. Christ was so much better. The infinite worth of knowing Christ Jesus made all that religion not only easy to give up, but he also let everything go if, if he had to, to serve Christ. His wealth, he lost it. His standing among the respected men of his people, he lost that. His physical health, um, boy, through all the arduous travel and persecution, sometimes his freedom was taken away. He, he was willing to let all of that go as long as he had Jesus and could serve him. Look back at verse 8 of uh, chapter 3. He says, more than that, I count all things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish so that I may gain Christ and may be found in him, not having a righteousness 
of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. It's the person of Christ and all that he did for us that made it so easy for him to let everything go. To have a relationship with Jesus is to have one's perspective on the world literally turned upside down. Actually, a better way to say it might be turned right side up since before you know Jesus, it's upside down. The world is upside down. So in verse 11, Paul speaks of attaining to the resurrection of the dead, that is, his salvation complete, uh, the soul cleansed of all sin, and the body glorified. He was looking forward to that. And he knows it's true. Glory awaits. And seeing Christ face to face is Paul's ultimate future. He's sure of that. It's a promise that we have as believers. So now we want to look more closely at what follows this discussion of the resurrection. We're going to pick up the glory of the resurrection again on another Sunday in verse 21 of this chapter, but in between verse 11 and verse 21, we have this very profound discussion of how that coming glory and perfection shaped how Paul lived his life. So two times he's going to say, brethren, and that kind of introduces a little paragraph. So verse 13, he says, brothers, and then in verse 17, um, it starts brothers, same thing, brethren. And he gives us two exhortations about himself, and we are to follow his example. So the first brethren in verse 13, um, uh, we're going to look at, but first I want to look at verse 12, because that sort of introduces the topic of those two paragraphs that start with brethren. So verse 12 is really important, because we always need to remember that apostles were men like us. So verse 12, not that I have already obtained it or have already become perfect, but I press on so that I may lay hold of that for which I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. So notice Paul's humility here. He doesn't need to impress anybody. He's not concerned that people think um, he's made it, that he's achieved some kind of perfection or anything like that. He's still a work in progress. We all are, aren't we? At least I hope progress is true of all of us. Paul doesn't need to pretend he's anything he isn't. He hasn't arrived, and he's very honest about that. Did you know there's actually certain Christian denominations that teach that we can become sinless and perfect in this life? Um, If you ever run into one of those run away, run away quickly. You will end up rationalizing all kinds of sin uh, to put on this sort of show that you're doing better than you really are. You never want to do that. Paul wasn't like that. He was open about his weaknesses and his failures. Paul himself declares, I have not yet become perfect. I am incomplete. I'm a man in process. So he said in verse 11 that he gave up his past, which was his whole life, to have Christ and to know Christ Verse 10, he said that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. And last time we said that is the power of Christ now, that resurrection power, to move us toward holiness, to kill sin in us, to live in the newness of life that he brings to us. That happened to Paul, but it is not, even in his mature years, a finished work at all. He still had to battle sin. The battle's not over. It's not over for any of us until we see Jesus face to face. So what do you do then? If you still got this lingering battle with sin going on that is constantly there, do you give up? Do you give in? Do you toss in the towel? Do you uh, embrace the corruption within and just say, well, that's just there. I'm just going to have to work with it and let it be there. No. Verse 12, Paul says, I press on. I press on. You don't stop fighting because you lose sometimes. This is especially true when you know that God himself is with you in the fight. You're not alone in your fight against the flesh and against your own sin. Why does he press on? Why press on? It's because his life has a purpose. 
That's the center of where we're going today. Jesus got hold of Paul in a very dramatic way. The story is actually told in Acts chapter 9, but several times in the book of Acts, Paul tells the whole story over again. That's how important it is, Paul's conversion and what happened to him. It's very important. The book of Acts is only 28 chapters, but several times that story of Paul's conversion appears in that brief, overall brief, you know, book in that sense. So here's a small part of um, what Paul said happened to him to Herod Agrippa, the king, in Acts chapter 26, verse, uh, starting at verse 13. So we're in Acts 26, verse 13. So Paul's giving his testimony. And he says, verse 13, At midday, O king, I saw on the way a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, shining all around me and those who were journeying with me. And when we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew dialect, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. And I said, Who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and stand on your feet. For this purpose, I have appeared to you, to appoint you a minister and a witness, not only to the things which you have seen, but also to the things in which I will appear to you, rescuing you from the Jewish people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you, to open their eyes so that they might turn from darkness to light and from the dominion of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. There's Jesus talking about faith as the means to salvation. That is why Jesus laid hold of Paul to bear witness for him, to serve him. So if you're a Christian, he has laid a hold of you too. And for the same reason, to serve him. And to become like him, to grow into the man or woman that God always meant for you to be, holy and wise and good, Jesus saved us for that purpose. He laid hold of us for this purpose, that we must lay, and we have to lay hold of that purpose for which he lay hold of us. So he called us to be his and gave us this purpose, and we need to grasp onto that purpose and live it out in our lives. How do we do that? Paul says we press on. We push ahead. We are not to be content with falling short. We press on. Somebody said that um, satisfaction is the grave of progress. It's like if you get to the point where, hey, I'm good, I'm good everything's all right. Well, you're not going to progress anymore. You've got to be honest about what needs to still happen the direction you need to still go, the work you still need to do. Don't get satisfied. Press on. Progress. To progress takes uh, intentionality from us and commitment. As with all worthy endeavors, what worthy thing doesn't require commitment and work? We are in a battle with our flesh, and battles are won by pressing on. All great generals in history they have one thing in common. They, they knew when to press on. They can kind of read a battlefield and they say, this is the moment, attack. The, the best generals just feel it. They can tell that this is the time. We are in a battle that never ends and we need to press on against that battle against sin. We need to press on every day against that. Our almighty general says it's always the right time to press on against sin and toward holiness. Now, in the next section, starting at verse 13, um, Paul applies this idea of press on to the Philippians and obviously to us by extension. Verses 13 through 16 then marks the first brethren section, and that's what we're going to focus on the rest of our time today. So verse 13, he says, Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but... One thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead. Let's stop right there. Here's the principle. It's a principle for the Christian life. It's applicable to every single Christian. This is the how of growing in Christian maturity. It's critical to the Christian life. It's Paul's one thing. 
the one thing he made a point to never leave off doing in his life. The one thing that keeps him moving toward the goal of Christ-likeness, of perfection, if you will. That's his goal. That should be our goal. And we're not going to make it, but we can bit better and better and closer and closer in our Christian life as we mature. And so his goal is this. And this is how he does it. Forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead. Are you doing that? Are you forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what's ahead? Let's talk about the forgetting idea first. Now with Paul and with many of us, um, what we are supposed to forget here, I think, is both a positive things and negative things. Some of us lean one way and some of us lean the other way. Some of us probably do both. They're both there are both good things to forget and bad things to forget. Achievements to forget and sins to forget. He doesn't mean literally forget either. I mean, there are reasons actually to remember uh, your past achievements and your sins. Matthew Henry says it really well. He said very wisely, there is a sinful forgetting of past sins and past mercies, which ought to be remembered for the exercise of constant repentance and thankfulness to God. But Paul forgot the things which were behind so as not to be content with present measures of grace. He was still for having more and more. Do you understand what he's saying there? He's saying you should remember past victories because that encourages you and it makes you thankful to God because he's the one working it in you. And you should remember past sins just as a warning about present sins. So that's the idea um, that Paul is conveying about forgetting. So forgetting here is not about being unaware of the past. It's not being chained to the past. That's the idea. It's not dwelling on the past, but instead turning the focus of our heart and our mind forward. The past can't be changed, but the future, who you are in the future, is to be embraced in Christ as an opportunity to glorify him. And if you look back too much, you've got your focus on the wrong place. So Paul says, forgetting what lies behind, I press on. I look forward. I'm reaching forward. Don't focus on the past, good or bad. The, the positive side of memories would be don't be content with where you are. People, You ever heard the expression, um, don't rest on your laurels? Laurels are like praise, right? Your, what things you were praised about. Don't look back and say, ever, well, I've done my part. I don't need to serve God anymore. I've, I've got such a great past. You may have prayed for somebody that really needed it. That is great. Your prayer life is not over. You shared the gospel. Excellent. Be ready to share it again. You were kind to your wife when you wanted to blow up at her praiseworthy indeed such self-control how about next time you took a short-term mission trip that is awesome how else does supporting missions come into focus in your life uh, for the future doesn't have to be going on a trip necessarily but how are you encouraging missions and supporting it Paul could have rested on his laurels. I mean, he was a Superman church planter, right? Asia Minor, then to Macedonia and Greece. He's planting churches all over the place. Apostle, prophet, theologian. He could have thought, man, I wrote the book of Romans. They'll be studying that for millennia. That, that is something. That's an achievement. The writer of scripture, the sufferer for Jesus. And he did suffer for Jesus. In fact, he describes the loss side of his life pretty effectively in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 24. He says, Five times I received from the Jews 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have spent in the deep. I have been on frequent journeys and frequent and dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my countrymen, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers on the sea, dangers among false brethren. I have been in labor and hardship through many sleepless nights, in hunger and thirst, often without food, and cold and exposure. Apart from such external things, there's the daily pressure on me of concern for all the churches. I mean, he did much. He suffered much for Christ. The temptation would be, 
I've done enough. I've done enough for Jesus. I'm going to take some me time now. You know, that's really not why Jesus laid hold of us, to take me time. Uh, that's not the purpose that we're here. Now, there's nothing wrong with taking a break. Even Jesus took his disciples away from the crowds for a while to take a little vacations and stuff to rest. You have to do that kind of a thing. But it doesn't mean um, you give up and just stop and say, I've done enough. I don't have to do anything for the Lord anymore. And it doesn't mean you have to do the same thing you were doing either. There are many ways to serve the Lord. I'm sure when I'm so old that uh, I'll have to retire because people won't listen to me anymore. But I hope it never occurs to me that I won't serve Jesus in some way, that I won't find some means of glorifying him with my life, that I won't press on towards something. If I just sit there and just be me, I'm not fulfilling my purpose. God gave me more time. I'm going to use it for him. That would be a bad end if I gave up serving him in some way. We were laid hold of by him for a purpose, and we should always have that purpose until we see him face to face and hear the well done. Well, now let's think about the other side of forgetting the negative side. And this is probably more common uh, with people in my experience. It's a bigger problem for most people, I should say. It, it's, it, it's not coasting after success, but paralysis because of past sins. Um, that is so wrong, and it's a tragedy. It really is. I can't serve Jesus, my King and Savior, because I was quite a bad person in my pre-Christian life, or even somewhere where I blew it as a Christian. I cannot shake the memories of what I have done. That is, that is another thing to be forgotten, to be left behind. And you're not thinking about it anymore. You're reaching forward. You're going forward for Christ. You're pressing on. You have to press on. So, and here's where Paul can help you. By his life. What do you think went through his mind? His dreams at night. He was a killer of Christians. Let me go back to that testimony he was giving to Herod Agrippa. Uh, I read a little bit ago. I didn't give you the first part of that when he talked about that. Let me read that for you. This is Acts 26 again. Um, earlier I kind of read from the middle of his testimony. This is how he actually started it. This is in Acts 26, 9. So then I thought to myself that I had to do many things hostile to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And this is just what I did in Jerusalem. Not only did I lock up many of the saints in prisons, having received authority from the chief priests, but I also, when they were being put to death, I cast my vote against them. And as I punished them often in the synagogues, I tried to force them to blaspheme and being furiously enraged at them, I kept pursuing them even to foreign cities. While so engaged as I was journeying to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests, and then boom, Jesus appears. The light surrounds him. Paul at one time killed the servants of God. That, that's just not an idea. He, he saw people. He dealt with people. He was enraged at people that loved Jesus. And he tried to make them deny Jesus. He tormented them, tortured them. He jailed them. All these memories would be in his head. Faces of anguish and suffering that he personally caused, that he was involved with. But remember, we talked about it last time. Paul was the premier example of God's grace to a monstrous human being. The Lord took Paul and transformed him and put him into service, specifically chose him for his service, probably the highest level of service of anybody you'll find in the New Testament. If you call Jesus Savior, you can put your past behind you, no matter how evil it was. God won't bring up your sins. God has cast them away, as the psalm says, as far as the east is from the west. He will not bring up your sins against you. He has set you free. That is a cause for deep joy. Joy born out of repentance and God's gracious mercy and apprehending his love for you. You're free.
Some people are so weighed down with their past, they don't lay hold of the reason that Christ laid hold of them. He saved them to serve him. He saved you to serve you. Satan is the accuser of the brethren, not Jesus. You are pardoned by him. You are freed by him. So walk out of the prison of guilt and feel the sunshine on your face. You ever hear the testimony of somebody that came out of many years in prison, just feeling the wind on their, uh, on their hair and the sunshine on their face and how glorious a feeling that is? That's what it should be like for you coming away from your past and being forgiven by Jesus. There's no condemnation in Christ Jesus. You are free, free to live for him. So now one thing you should never do um, with this passage is misuse it. And because sin is serious. And some people um, kind of go in a different direction. If, if you do have a sin problem, I mean an ongoing sin problem, or you've done something you need to make right or to confess, don't pull this verse out and say, I am commanded to forget that and press on. That would be misusing it, wouldn't it? You are hindering me by reminding me of my sins. Don't minimize sin. God's mercy doesn't minimize sin. It pardons it. Those are two very different things. And if somebody brings up something truly in your past and you've done all you can to make it right, then you can humbly ask that person to put that in the past where it belongs. And that's okay to do that. You should, you should leave it there too and press on. But if it's a current problem or things have been left undone that maybe you need to do, uh, confess those sins, apologize, make things right. Heartfelt repentance then is in order for that. And that helps you actually when you truly repent of those things and have made amends as best as you can. Then you're free to really put it behind you and not think about it anymore and not let it interfere with anything anymore. So you don't want to grab onto this text and misuse it and say, um, when you haven't taken care of everything in your past, to just say, um, I don't need to. Don't bother me about that. Uh, be humble. Be humbled by your sin. Never minimize your own sin, but once dealt with, then leave it behind and press forward. Press forward. We all have things we're deeply ashamed of, and we can let it humble us, but we should never let it keep us from joyfully serving Jesus. Press on. Press on. Verse 14. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. That's almost poetry right there. Paul's kind of using the language of sports, like running races. You know, the successful runner focuses on the goal. He's not looking around. If you look around, you lose. So he's using that kind of imagery there. Everything, focus-wise, is forward here. He's not going to be distracted, and so we should not turn back either to successes or failures on our part. It takes our eyes off the prize, and the prize is the goal. So we're striving for perfection, to be complete in Christ. That's the direction we're going. We know we can't have it here, but we can win victories here. And the prize will be great appreciation from our king on that day we see him face to face. He will look at our running that race, our pursuing, our moving forward and toward his upward call, and he'll bless us for that. He'll thank us for that. He'll um, honor us for that. So by pressing toward the goal, we are growing, spiritually growing in love, in humility, in purity, in wisdom, in self-control, in kindness, in faith, all the Christian virtues. You could just run through the whole list there. That's the upward call, all of those wonderful things. Away from self toward this goal of Christ-likeness to serve selflessly our most holy and gracious King. Okay, let's look at verse 15 and 16. Let's kind of wrap this up here. They're pretty interesting. He seems to be addressing people who might be a little skeptical of Paul's counsel here. Um, perhaps there are those who, who think well of their achievements, and maybe there are those that think they really need to be stuck on their sins. But um, verse 15, he says, Let us therefore, as many as are perfect, have this attitude, and if in anything you have a different attitude, 
God will reveal that to you also. Now, I've got to talk for a second about the word perfect here because most people get stuck right there and they go, he just said he's not perfect. And now he's talking to people who are perfect. He said in verse 12, he's not perfect. So who are these perfect people he's writing to? Well, perfect here really isn't the best translation of this verse, not the way we use the word perfect. Um, The New King James Version actually does it perfectly. It translates both verse 12 and verse 15 perfectly. The word in verse 12 is a verb, a perfect tense verb. So it's the word perfect or complete with a the perfect tense, which in Greek means uh, completed. It's a done deal. So the New King James Version translates in verse 12, perfected, which is a good translation. That's really what it is. It's a verb. So Paul says, I have not yet been perfected. So there's a noun in verse 15. It's a related word. It's a similar word, but it's uh, it's a noun. It's not the idea of perfected. He's, it's It's the word that often is translated mature or grown up or complete. It's uh, sort of arrived. It's, it's, uh, mature is a much better translation, and that's what the New King James uses as well in verse 15. Let us, as many of us as are mature, the English Standard Version uses that word there as well, and that's a much better translation than using the word perfect. It's too confusing. He's not talking perfect. He's talking about people that have lived in Christ for a while and have truly grown in him. So mature is a completely appropriate translation of the word. I think it best conveys what he has in mind here. So let's get back to the idea. So he's saying, if you are mature, then embrace my advice here to forget what lies behind. Probably, if he's talking to mature Christians, he's probably talking about their successes. And he's saying, press on, keep pressing on. And he assures them that if that is not where they are, if they are um, inclined to focus on that, he says, God will reveal that to you. He's saying, um, if you don't trust me on this one, God will reveal to you that that's not where your focus should be on your past successes. Because some, honestly, some minister types uh, get very focused on their successes. And he's saying, don't even, don't even go there. So he, I, I could totally see who he's talking to, the kind of person he's talking to. So um, he's saying, don't, glory in what you've accomplished. Just forget it and press on. There's more to do. There's more to do. So keep going. Whatever it is, serve the Lord in some way. So that is a comfort. You you may safely ask God, and what Paul's encouraging them to do here, to expose, to reveal to you ways that you are letting the past, good or bad, distract you from pressing on to the upward call of Christ Jesus. The Spirit of God is with you to aid you in that whole process. So do it. So Paul's talking to these people he's acknowledging are mature and he's saying, you know, if you don't understand what I'm saying here, you you will. God's going to show it to you. So you just be aware and you follow this idea there. So finally we come to verse 16. He says, however... Let us keep living by that same standard to which we have attained. He's actually worried about people sliding back if they're not moving forward. So it's like um, you're climbing a hill, you know, so you're not just standing on an even ground when you're pressing on in the Christian life. And if you stop, the, the weight is, is downward, not forward. You've got to keep working forward there. So don't lose what you have achieved, he's saying. Don't go back to the world or back to old habits. And in the next section, he's actually going to talk about people that seem to have done that. So my brothers and sisters, forget what lies behind and press on. That's the one thing you must do. Press on. Everything else comes after that. The mature Christian makes Christ his or her all in all, um, religious people see that as uh, extreme or scary sometimes. You know, like, well, you people are obsessed with you. You ever heard of a Jesus freak, somebody being called Jesus freak? That's what they used to call Christians when I was younger. Um, Why would they call you a freak? Because you really believe it, and you're really pressing on. You're really following him. You love him. He's not just the religious part of your life. Most religious people compartmentalize God. They just keep God in this place in their heart or their mind where he doesn't really interfere with anything else. But the mature Christian isn't that at all. 
That's not even reasonable. Is that a reasonable approach to God to compartmentalize him? Is it reasonable to put our creator and redeemer in a box for our benefit and we just take him out when we want him? Is, are we the center of the universe or is he the center of the universe? Who lives for who? Who made who for who for their glory? No, it's not, we didn't make God for our glory. So that's not reasonable. It's reasonable to do the one thing, to press on toward him for his glory and in his service. Let's pray. God, help us to press on. Let us advance in holiness, in love for you, in service. Let our love and wisdom grow. Let us be humble regarding our achievements, which are your achievements anyway. And let us know the freedom of forgiveness. How tragic to sit in a prison cell of guilt when you have unlocked the door for us. So give us grace to understand both our forgiveness and your plans for us and our future. Help us to press on. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So next time we'll pick it up at verse 17, the next paragraph where he begins, brothers. All right. God bless. We'll see you next time.